This is the moon. Well, not the moon moon. This is a seven meter wide scale model of the moon that's about half a million times smaller than the real thing. It's on display here at the Powerhouse Museum in Sydney to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landings. Yes, 50 years ago, we landed on the surface of this thing, but we haven't been back since 1972. However, in May 2019, NASA announced they were accelerating their plans to put humans back on the surface of the moon by 2024. And that begs the question, what will the moon look like in say 10, 20, 30, or even 50 years time? And when are humans gonna finally live there? Five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff, we have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Velocity 2,195 feet per second. First things first, we need to get back there. Now, in the 50s and 60s, NASA created a whole suite of spacecraft and capsules, like the Mercury capsule behind me, to put people into space. This time around, they're building an incredibly powerful rocket. It's known as the Space Launch System. The rocket will carry a new crew capsule called Orion to an international space station that NASA is calling Gateway. It's very sci-fi, I know. Over the next decade, NASA will build the Gateway with international partners like the European Space Agency and Canada's Space Agency. The station will act like an outpost and astronauts staying there will be able to move between the station and the surface of the moon in reusable lunar landers. Now that we've got a plan to go back and it's full steam ahead for NASA's new rocket, we can start to think about how the moon might look in say, five years time. And we know NASA's new program, known as Artemis, is set to include at least one milestone. NASA will put a woman on the moon for the very first time. And you can imagine that billions of people around the world will want to tune into these historic first female steps on the moon. And a fundamental part of that process will be NASA's deep space network the very same network that broadcast the first moon landings in 1969. It's an unheralded part of the moon's future, but dishes like this one at the Canberra Deep Space Communication Complex in Australia are the reason we get to see the moon landings at all. With these huge dishes listening in, the next decade will provide us with some of the best live images of the moon that we've ever seen. Next time when we go to the moon, we'll have full high def 3D you know, images coming back. And we'll be able to receive those images with no problem at all. The technology has moved along where we can get far more bandwidth these days. So That's Glenn Nagel. He's the outreach coordinator at Canberra's Deep Space Communication Complex, which currently transmits signals back and forth between spacecraft all across our solar system. Now, Glenn and the complex are going to get a lot busier as we plan to put humans back on the moon and eventually settle there. Uh, certainly the Deep Space Network will be supporting those missions. We're already in training, we have been for a year for the first Artemis 1 mission, that first test flight around the moon and back, and already planning for Artemis 2 to send humans around the moon and back. But once a, a lunar base perhaps is established in the future, maybe somewhere down near the southern polar region of the moon, by that stage we'll probably have a network of communication satellites in orbit around the moon. Once our communications are well and truly up and running, we'll begin to probe and explore and hunt for resources on the moon. Taking advantage of the stuff that's on the moon is known as in-situ resource utilization. And over the next decade, a lot of lunar science will be dedicated to trying to find the moon's resources. James Carpenter of the European Space Agency believes that at the end of the decade, we might even see something that starts to resemble an Antarctic base. Initially, you'll see robotic missions uh, which uh, will uh, make initial measurements, produce some science in new locations, explore things like the, the ice that we know now is at the, the lunar poles. Um, and then over time, you'll see this building up research capability, uh, eventually with, with humans tending that research infrastructure. So you may envisage something that looks a bit like Antarctica, perhaps coming in the, the future with, right. with people with a, a sustained and sustainable um, research capability at the lunar surface. The water ice that researchers have found at the moon's poles may prove to be a valuable resource for humans if we want to go even further into the solar system. That's because it could be harvested and used for rocket fuel. The cost of launching water or extra rocket fuel from Earth to moon is astronomical. 
but if we find and use water that's already at the moon, it's going to be much, much cheaper, and we could potentially even begin to see a new type of space manufacturing takeoff. There are all sorts of industries that would benefit from being on the moon. And in the 2030s and 2040s, lunar mining, lunar manufacturing, and even lunar radio astronomy could take off. And then there's the promise of lunar tourism. In 2023, SpaceX plans to send Japanese billionaire Yusaku Maezawa and a handful of artists into lunar orbit. But the promise of lunar tourism may even be greater than that, and it may inspire humans to settle on the surface of the moon. I really think that the first human settlement on the moon will exist because of tourism, because that's really the only excuse for humans to be wandering around on the moon. That science fiction author Andy Weir, who based his second book, Artemis, on a human colony living and working on the moon in the 2070s. You know, if there was a city on the moon, that's the only place you can go to just look at Earth in its entirety all at mm. once. Now, people travel all the way across the Pacific or whatever just to go to an island to just peacefully look at the ocean. The extremely optimistic would suggest that we'll have people living on the moon within the next two decades, but a more realistic scenario will likely see humans temporarily stay on the moon. We'll do science, we'll understand how space affects the human body, and we'll develop the tools that help us travel further into the solar system. You know, the moon is not a habitable place to live. There's an atmosphere, there may be a bit of water, but I mean, it's a temporary, it's, it's, a, it's a stepping stone to where I think people are really focusing on, which is the ha eventual habitation of a, of a nearby planet. That next destination, Mars. Space agencies like NASA and commercial organisations like SpaceX are already trying to take humans to Mars within the next decade. But for us to truly colonise the red planet, the moon is going to be an incredibly important test bed. If you want to go to Mars, the moon is the next place you're going to go with humans. And you're going to go there to learn what it means to live and work off world. Mm. You're going to learn how to use local resources, how to start building things like reusability, how to create a sort of cost effective and solid approach to exploration yeah. that you can then turn forward. That's one part. The truth is it's really bloody hard to predict the future. I mean, who would have thought in 1969 after Apollo 11 that we'd basically not visit the moon for 50 years? However, with renewed international interest growing in the moon, it's getting bigger and bigger every single day. It seems our return to the moon is imminent. In 10 years time, this scale model of the moon is not likely to change all that much. Humans would have been back to the moon, including the first woman, and we may have set up a small base at the lunar south pole. But in 50 years time, we would have completely changed the face of the moon. We would have given it a new smile. There'll be a scientific outpost, a sprawling city in fact, where humans will work, research and live. We'll be able to pick up rocks from the lunar surface, smelt them to make metals and rocket fuel, and eventually the moon will be a stepping stone for our farthest reaches into the cosmos. And for that reason, the future of the moon is incredibly bright.